догнать пацана, посчитать потери Суммы нули, погибать на сцене Снова один, прогуляюсь без тени Заливаю лит, поцелуй на шее Эй, эй, как там рад Правда назад, на черный каскад Вижу твой взгляд, стель на гаяр Не мог тебя взять, но ты не моя Так дать пацана, посчитать потери Суммы нули, погибать на сцене Снова один, прогуляюсь без тени Заливаю лит, поцелуй на шее Правда назад, черный каскад Вижу твой взгляд, степь на гаяр Не мог тебя взять, но ты не моя Эти понты покупались во рту, твои мозги затупились к утру. Так дайте пацанам посчитать потери, суммы нули погибают на сцене. Снова один прогуляюсь без тени, заливаю лит, поцелуй на шее. Э, э, как там рад, правда назад, черный каскад. Вижу твой взгляд, стерн на гаяк, мог тебя взять, но ты не моя. Так дайте пацанам посчитать потери, суммы нули Снова один, прогуляюсь без тени Заливаю лит, поцелуй на шее Э, э, как там рад Правда назад, черный каскад Вижу твой взгляд, степь на гаяк Мог тебя взять, но ты не моя Так дайте пацана посчитать потери Суммы нули погибают на сцене Снова один прогуляюсь без тени Заливаю лит, поцелуй на шее Э, э, как там рад Правда назад, черный каскад Вижу твой взгляд, степь на гаяр Не мог тебя взять, но ты не моя Так дайте пацана посчитать потери Суммы нули погибают на сцене Снова один прогуляюсь без тени Заливаю лит, поцелуй на шее Э, э, как там рад Назад, черный каскад Вижу твой взгляд, степь на гаяр Не мог тебя взять, но ты не моя Are we ready to bring in our guest? Is he here? He's here. Yay! Let's, let's do it. All right. Hello. Hello. This is what happens when you invite men who aren't technolo technologically savvy and they can't find the link to the show. <laughs> But I found it. <laughs> I'm so glad you did. <laughs> you don't leave us hanging out here. Hey, Scott Ritter's no, coming and then he doesn't going, show up. Yeah. If he ever figures out how to turn on his computer. <laughs> You're a man back. of your word. I Welcome knew you'd back. make it. Great to have you here. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Wonderful to have you, Scott. Um, I just wanted to start off. You know, we've got this big anti-war rally coming up on Sunday, the Rage Against the War Machine rally in Washington, D.C. And, of course, you were originally slated to speak at this rally. And I was so disappointed to hear that... Uh, They disinvited you or some of the organizers disinvited you. And I just want to clear the air and get that out of the way right off the top and, and let you explain why you won't be speaking on Sunday. Well, I mean, <clears throat> we'll, we'll, we'll just start at the, at the, the beginning. I was invited by uh, uh, a guy named Nick Brana, who is the head of the, the people's party. Nice yeah. guy. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, <laughs> I mean, I'll be straight up. He and I are not politically aligned. Um, you know, I'm I'm very conservative, and he's very not conservative, which is okay. That's what makes America sure. wonderful. I mean, it's it's not like I'm anti him. It's just that he's very activist minded, etc. And 
I'm not. Um, but he came up. I was doing a, a, a book presentation of my, uh, my, my new book, uh, Disarm at the Time of Perestroika. I love uh, that book, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It was a, a book that um, I was suppo originally supposed to give the book uh, presentation at a, at a restaurant called The Russian Samovar. Um, we were modeling it off of, um, off of a very successful book event I did at a, 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 a venue in Poughkeepsie, uh, Farmers and Chefs, um, where about 65, 70 people came. They, they bought tickets. The tickets included a book. Um, they came. They had a wonderful dinner. I gave a, a, I spoke. I answered questions and I signed books. And I mean, it was just so much fun that I reached out to the Russian Samovar because uh, when I lived in New York City, um, I actually had developed a very good relationship with the owner. And, um, but he, you know, he died and his uh, daughter in law took it over. Uh, good, good lady. So I called up and she said, Yeah, no, I'd, uh, we'd like to do it. She said, But, you know, let's just keep the presentation about disarmament uh, because they've been, because of the name Russian Samovar, mm. um, the pro Ukrainian crowd was trying to shut them down. And, yep. and so she said, You know, we, we're struggling as it is because of the pandemic. We just don't need any hassle. I said, Not a problem at all. This will only about be about disarmament. This is pure. How you know disarmament in the time of perestroika talk, um, and then um, literally uh, just less than a week before the event was supposed to go down, she um, I, I well w actually a week prior I, I gave a presentation here in Del Mar um, at a lot at the local library that um, <laughs> was just supposed to be a small presentation with the local anti-war group again about this situation in Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainian activists decided they were going to hijack the event, and so mm -hmm. things, got little, things got a little uh, interesting. And um, mm -hmm. the video that was taken by the um, the videographer of this organization, Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace, historically his best video had like 800 views. Um, this thing had 200,000 views within a week. I mean, it went viral. It did go um, viral. And um, and apparently, um, even though I felt like I held my own and uh, made the case, um, the pro-Ukrainian crowd um, started attacking the Russian Samovar. So they pulled the plug. Oh, and, um, and then there's a wonderful guy, uh, Randy Credico. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. Randy. Uh, sure, I know Randy. Yeah, Randy uh, is, a, is a talk show host at WBAI. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he, he was going to come up with a bunch of people from Washington, D.C., I guess, including Nick. Uh, and it was canceled. So he said no. And uh, Randy did plan B. He found another venue and we held the event. And uh, at that event, uh, I gave my presentation. Now, I've been speaking a long time in public. And so, you know, I guess you can say I'm, I'm fairly practiced and some people would say I'm, I'm, I'm good. Um, but the presentation I gave on that Sunday was... Uh, I knocked it out of the ballpark and I knew halfway through that this was something special. I'm doing some, the sad thing is nobody recorded it, but that's okay. But, um, Damn. it, it, <laughs> it was, it was a really, really solid presentation. Um, and in the end I talked about using this book, Disarm the Time of Perestroika. Um, I, I had been thinking uh, a lot with Jeff Norman, the guy I, co I, I collaborate with on uh, ask the inspector broadcast and a uh, podcast. Jeff and I have known each other for 20 years now. And we've been talking about, Hey, what if we took this book, got the book published in Russia, and then I went to Russia and did a book tour in Russia and introduced this concept to the Russian people? What if we captured their reaction on tape? If we brought a film crew and did this, and we came back and we made a documentary film, and then we took it around the country and started to expose Americans to the reality of Russians and how they feel, how they think, how they feel about arms control. And maybe we could get something going. And man, maybe we could have a million man march in, uh, in, in Central Park, like they did in 1982, that broke the, back, the freeze on arms control, got the INF treaty. What if we did that again? What if we did something like that? And Jeff that and I were excited about awesome. it. That would be awesome. Well, but <laughs> so we've been talking awesome. about it. I was so caught up in this presentation that I blurted it out. I gave it in my question and answer. I said, this is what we're going to do. I committed to it. Boom. And Nick Brandt came up and he goes, you need to give that presentation at the rally. And I said, what rally? He what said, rally? The big, the big anti-war rally. I said, I don't, Dick, I don't do anti-war rallies anymore. I got burned on Iraq. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I got the scars on the palm of my hand. When the burner mm -hmm. turns red, I don't put my hands on the burner anymore. Uh, you know, I learned my lesson. Um, 
I said, no, I, I really don't want to do that. I wish you the best of luck, but I, I don't want to do this. Ah, um, but Nick is very persuasive. Nick, uh, he kept <laughs> coming and it. coming and coming <laughs> and talking about how important this speech was and that yeah. message, that message. And I was so caught up having just delivered this message and seen the reaction. I was getting excited. I said, yeah, okay, I'll go. I'll do the thing. <laughs> but I knew in my heart of hearts it just wasn't going to work out uh, because I am a lightning rod for any yes. number of reasons. And um, if, you know, I have no problem being a lightning rod when people disagree with me. Those are the kind of arguments I like because I'm pretty well prepared. And um, I feel I wouldn't want to debate you. I can hold my own. I, <laughs> I, 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 I took on Christopher Hitchens, who is uh, yeah. one of the premier masters of the English language. And he is loquacious and eloquent and he uses the right words. And I crushed him on a stage in Terrytown, New York. Wipe the floor with the guy. Um, so I'll, I'll debate anybody, anytime, anywhere. We can do this. But see, they don't want to have that debate. So they bring up, you know, uh, my past. Um, and my past includes a criminal conviction for um, what they call a, a, a sexual, um, illegal sexual contact with a minor. Hmm. There was never sexual contact with a minor. There was That's never right. a minor. There was, it was a police sting operation where, um, under normal circumstances, uh, it, it would never have been brought to the attention. I, I, look, I'll give you a, an example. Um, I mean, I don't want to get, you know, people are interested in the purient details of it. Um, mm. Here, here, here's, here's what I want to tell people. Um, let me destroy your life. Okay, let me, let me eliminate your ability to earn a living for, for your let, First of all, let me put you on a crusade that you believe in that you think is the greatest crusade in the history of the world, that, that it can save the world, save lives. Let me get you committed to this crusade. Let me have you put everything into it, years of your life, put into it thinking you're doing the right thing. And then I'm going to have the government turn on you and destroy you, uh, deny you employment opportunities, attack your family, literally attack your family, attack you. Um, and I'll get you at your lowest possible point where literally – um, you're too proud to turn for anybody for help. And then I'm going to put you on the internet and I'm going to see what you do. All right. Now, I'm not saying everybody behaves the same. I will tell you that I engaged in no criminal activity, none whatsoever. Never have, never will. But what I did on the internet is not something that people should be proud of. It's, uh, especially if you're married, I'll be the first one to say that, uh, but it wasn't criminal. And if anybody's going to hold to me account, it's going to be my wife, That's who true. by the way has forgiven me. We've been married 31 years. I have twin daughters. They they have no problem with it. My friends who were where they're they're all good. So all the people closest to me understand what happened, understand it wasn't criminal, and understand that I was at the lowest possible moment in my entire life. Yes, you um, were. And, and if again, like I said, I'm not going to get into the details because it's none of your business. <laughs> That's it wasn't right. Criminal, so you have no right to know. Uh, but what happened is. Um, a prosecutor saw the name and said he can uh, he can he can make money with this and uh, he he went off and he started a prosecution you know it's a computer crime what uh, what they alleged me doing but they wouldn't investigate they wouldn't they wouldn't look at my computer really oh no see i'm the hmm. one who said uh, i'm the one who said we can end this thing now why don't we take my computer and give it to the prosecutor and say have at it, guys. There's nothing on there. There's no crime. Let's go. And they went, we don't want your computer. Well, I never I knew that, that important oh, detail. You don't know. There's mm. a lot you don't know. First mm. of all, the incident in question was in an adults-only chat room. Yep. An adults-only chat room where the person that had to go in had to make a profile that uh, said they were over 18. And then on three occasions had to confirm that they were over 18 before they were allowed to interact. If two people meet, and they both agree at the start that they're over 18, anything that happens after that is ain't a crime. Right? That's okay, because the prosecutor is corrupt. Anyways, we, we tried to give him the computer, and um, mm. my lawyer, first of all, said, no. <laughs> no way you're giving that computer to the prosecutor. I said, why not? He said, because they'll find something. I said, they won't mm. find anything. Or they'll plant right. something. Well, that's different, because, no, you take, you take uh, you scan. You, you get 
yeah. you do a scan of it. So if they planted something, it would be different from the scan. And no, it doesn't work that way. We're not right. stupid. Um, but we actually went out and hired uh, an NSA, a former NSA and a former FBI uh, cyber people and turned the computers over to them. And they did a top to bottom scrub of everything. And they came back and said, ain't nothing on here, boss. So we went to the prosecutor and said, here's the computer. Prosecutor said, I don't want to touch the computer. I don't want to have anything to do with the computer. And we're like, but you should, since this is a computer crime. Nope. So, so they just to, use their chat logs, basically? They, they just used the chat log of an adult chatting with an adult. Yeah. Right. Um, so we took the computer and we went to a, um, a retired um, special agent for the um, Secret Service who was one of the first people involved in um, the uh, computer crimes against children. Uh, he basically helped write the book for it. Uh, he has prosecuted over 25,000 cases, almost all of which were success successfully put people away. And we came to him. Understand what I'm telling you. I'm going after the guy that prosecutes bad guys. I'm not going after the guy that defends bad guys. I'm going after the guy that prosecutes bad guys. And I said, I need you to look at this computer. And he said, no. And we said, why? And he said, because I will find something where there's smoke, there's fire. This is what I do for a living. People come to me and they say, do this and I will find it. And then you're screwed. You're going to jail forever. They said, don't let me look at this computer. And my lawyer got scared and was like, I said, give them the computer. And I signed a waiver. I said, I, you're not a bad lawyer. I'm making this decision. Give them the computer. I have the letter. Someday I'm going to write the book and I'll publish the letter. The letter that the guy wrote to the judge for the first time in his entire career, he said, because he, he said, I have encourage people not to do this. I will find it. If there's something on there, I will find it. He said, for the first time in my career, I can write the letter I'm getting ready to write. There is no indication of a crime whatsoever. No indication of, uh, you know, a desire for underage uh, children. There's nothing here. You know, yeah, there's this adult adult stuff, but that's, that's his business. It's not none of my business. We're talking about a crime. There's no evidence of a crime. Not only that, he then went through the police report, and he said, this is an unprosecutable case. There's no crime that was committed. But not only that, the police officer violated everything, every, you know, every investigatory technique, et cetera, uh, you know, entrapment. I mean, the whole, you know, everything you could do wrong as a cop, he did yeah, wrong. He did. That's so right. he said, you know, not only is there no indication of a crime, but the cop. So he was ready to testify. This is like the leading expert in America ready to testify on my behalf. The judge went, no, nope, inadmissible. We're not going to let him, we're not going to let him testify. And then they went and, um, you know, and, and they got some files unsealed on uh, incidents that occurred in 2001, which by the way, again, none of your business, but no crime was committed. The case was thrown out, dismissed, and the files were sealed. That means first thing that it's a legal nullity. There's no crime. It's a nullity. It's sealed for a reason because you don't, this stuff should never be in public, public life. The, yeah. the cop <laughs> who, who leaked it, um, he, you know, he initiated something and the FBI was brought in. This is a fact that not too many people understand. The FBI came in under orders from the attorney general to get rid of they See, said, and happened. that's where we left off last time when we had you in for an they interview said, and we talked, you, know, you told the story about what? how the FBI had been messing with you at that point for well, they're, they're over a decade. Order. So the, uh, the FBI came in and they broke the law. You know, they did, they, what they did is they got a judge to unseal the files. Illegal as hell. Illegal as hell. Can't do And I'll tell you why it's illegal as hell, because I later challenged that. And I won. We took it up to the New York Supreme Court and they came back with a unanimous decision and said, you can't unseal the files. It's not allowed. But the FBI got a judge to do it. And then the files were turned over to the FBI, who worked with the prosecutors from the Northern District of New York, right here in Albany, New York. And normally when this is happens, you're dead. When the FBI gets files and they go to the Northern District, you're going to go to jail on these kind of charges. No crime was committed. And we went to them and we said, we need you to write a letter that says that. And they said, we, we don't write that kind of letter. What we'll give you is a note that says that, um, you know, that, that uh, basically that 
you were a target and now you're no longer a target. Meaning, you know, it's so if an employer comes up and asks, well, you had this this incident, you could give them the letter and this kind of letter that they'd look and say, okay, this is a clean deal. But the point I'm trying to make is everybody who jumps on 2001, who thinks they know what they're talking about, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, no crime was committed. The files were sealed. Uh, anything you think you know from the files, and I'm sort of hampered here because um, I have an ongoing appeal. And part of the appeal is uh, appealing what happened in terms of the release of the files. I can say that what the public thinks they know is about that much of the record, that this much of the record existed in all the stuff that the FBI reviewed and said, there is no crime here. Let's get out of here was never turned over to Pennsylvania. It all disappeared magically. All the stuff, and I can't talk about the content of it because that's using something as a shield. And once you use it as a shield, then they're allowed to use it as a sword. We're saying they're not allowed to use the sword. So I can't go into the details of why. There's, you know, that's just, a, if there's a sealed file, that information can never be public. That's right. Um, that's that's that. Pennsylvania. Wasn't that where the Cosby case got overturned and he got kicked? He's well, you, free well, you don't know what, because again, of a sealed Again, what you don't file. what you don't know is that my current uh, my current appeal is um, is based on the Cosby case. Bingo. Yeah. Yes, because so, it's the same you know, thing. They, the prosecutor used uh, evidence. Judge, uh, here file. we had a judge. Uh, I mean. Uh, uh, so they they illegally got the file. They went back to a judge and illegally got 2001. And in applying to it, what the prosecutor said is, we cannot successfully prosecute this case based upon what happened in Pennsylvania because there's nothing here. Right. We have to have 2001 so that we can manufacture a case. So you have to give us the file. If you don't give us the file, we cannot prosecute this guy. So what he's saying is, whatever happened in 2009 between consenting adults isn't a crime. But what they have to do is convince the jury that I really intended to be talking to a, a, an underage person. So they, they thought they were going to get something in 2001, but they cherry picked it to make a case up. But it was illegal what they did. Mm -hmm. So we went to the judge and said, you can't, you can't do this. It's illegal. The, the New York law, we cited it. Apparently in said, Pennsylvania, they do it anyway. All, as all the the time. Well, what she said them. is, um, I will not reverse the decision of a New York court um, no matter what the, the soundness of your league are, if you want New York, you know, she said, I will respect the decision of a New York court. If you want to change that, you have to go to the New York court and get them to change it. So we did. And we went to New York, we took it up the chain of command and the highest court in New York said illegal as hell. It should never have been unsealed. Boom. We came back to the judge and said, Hey, Hey. And she went, no, nah, we're going to, we're going to let it stay. Uh, I, I'm just telling you, the fix was in from day one. Um, so, I mean, people have a problem with this. I mean, again, if, if you're going to tell me that you object to what I did in an adults only chat room with another consenting adult, that's okay. I, I actually will say I, I respect that. I understand that. Um, if you're perfect, if your name is Jesus Christ or you're the Virgin Mary, I, I get it. Um, otherwise, you're a hypocrite and you know, God forbid somebody ever gets a hold of your Google search history. Um, Let you know, he among us who is without sin cast you know, that first stone. Yeah, and I, but again, if that's their position, I can at least respect that. If you want to take a moral principled stance based upon non-criminal activity and say, I condemn you for that, I'll be like, that's your business. No problem. But what they're trying to say, and I mean, the term that you... you. They're calling me a lie. twice convicted pedophile. Yes. And that's a, I was convicted once, not twice, and but has not nothing to do with a pedophile. pedophile. Yeah. I, mean, you, and, you, and, you know, I want to make possible. this so clear, Scott, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I've been <laughs> I've been answering people on social media now for a month who post they get up in my replies on Twitter and they say, How can you back Scott Ritter when he's a twice convicted pedophile? And I'm like, hold up. You know, I want to make this so clear. Scott Ritter, to the best of my knowledge, never, ever interacted with an underage girl. One well, underage person. He could have been, interacted. I mean, I say, oh, you're, he interacted with a boy. No, he, he I never interacted with, an with an underage person. <laughs> who was an adult. <laughs> I who presume was the cop was an adult. an adult. Who was an adult from the start. 
Yeah. And, and then, and then, I mean, again, I don't want to go into the details, but this adult, after engaging as an adult, injected a fantasy element. Mm-hmm. Um, stupid, not criminal. Uh, right. You know, in, end of story. But you end know, story. I don't care about. Um, let me let me put it this way. You know who hates pedophiles more than any of your listeners? Mm-hmm. You. No, no, besides me. <laughs> Who hates them? Who will kill them? Inmates. Right. Send a pedophile to jail. Watch what happens. True. They sent me to jail thinking that was going to be the end of Scott Ritter. They set me up. They wanted me dead. They sure did, Scott. And I went to jail. The first thing the the, the corrections officers tell you is um, don't tell anybody about your case. Just keep your head down. Keep it low. And I'm like, my face was all over the damn television. Um, you don't tell anybody about my inmates follow this stuff. They're addicted to crime stories. That's and, right. <laughs> and so when I showed up, they were literally lining up to kill me, mm-hmm. literally lining up to kill me. And so what I did is what you're not supposed to do. I took my paperwork to the head of the gangs. And I said, you guys want to kill me? Bam. I'm right here. Read it. Pass it around. Everybody should know your story. I'm not hiding from anything in this paperwork. Nothing. And at the end of that, if when that's done, you want to kill me? We'll go out back and I'll give you your bet. You can take your best shot. I'll take 50 of you down, but you'll probably get me in the end. But read that first. The Crips, the Bloods, the Latin Kings have a history of killing pedophiles. Yes, they do. They all came back and said, you got screwed. You got screwed. You're not a criminal. It's and obvious then, to anyone who really looks at it or has yeah. two brain cells but the other thing together. Too, the corrections officers said the same thing. They're all saying, yeah. why are you here? Who did you piss off? Who did you anger? Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll give you another thing. To, to get parole, they sent me to five and a half years. Five and a half years was the, the sentence. Now, I could get out in 18 months. Um, at, at 18 months, the uh, judge and the uh, prosecutor put the kibosh on me getting parole. They are allowed to do that. The first time out, they're allowed to interfere and say, nope. And the reason why they said no is because I never pled guilty. See, they offered me a deal. They were going to put me in jail for 40 years. They offered 40 me a deal. Years? Yeah, 40 Damn, years? Damn, that's a Jelaine Maxwell sentence right there. They said, they said 40 years or you can cop a plea to this one charge and you'll just get parole, meaning no jail. All I had to do is plead guilty to one charge and I'd get no parole. I'd have to register as a sex offender. And I said, Innocent men don't plead guilty to anything. My lawyer's going, this is the best deal possible, best deal possible. You got to take it. I said, no, we're going to trial. I will never plead guilty to anything I haven't done. But you could go to jail. Then I will go to jail. But I am never going to plead guilty. And we went to trial. And as I told you, all the evidence was suppressed. They entered stuff they're not supposed to. I got convicted five and a half years. Now, and to wasn't get parole, it really more about convicting you in the court of public opinion, Scott? All it was about. That was all it was about. Is exactly. to destroy my reputation. Now, to get paroled, and this is an important thing that people need to understand, you can't be paroled unless you plead guilty. You can't be paroled. I had a five and a half year sentence. Let me give you a quick headline of how this story ends. I was paroled after three years. Well, Scott, did you plead guilty? Nope. How did you get paroled? How did you pull that off? I pulled it off by being honest. So you have to go, as, as a sexual offender, you have to go through sexual offender treatment mm-hmm. because obviously you're you know mentally ill and all this kind of stuff so i and i went to the head shrink and uh to do the intake interview and he's like well you got to sign this form and this form says i am guilty of the charges and i i said i am not guilty of the charges uh and uh and he said well you'll you'll never be able to i said here let me just make it clear to you i took my file just like i did with the with the gangs and i put it in front of him I said, everything in that file is true. I'm not denying anything. Everything in that file is true. None of it's a crime. And he went, so you'll enter the program. And if I can convince you that what you did was a crime, or we can get a majority of the people in your group to disagree with you and say, it's a crime, then you'll you know, reverse. And I said, well, we'll talk about that then, because I don't think it's going to happen. Um, and I said, but under that circumstance, I'll go in. So I went in there to a person. 
everybody in the group went, you got screwed. And this guy said, you got screwed. You didn't commit a crime. And this is a guy who habitually fails people because they won't admit to their crime. He wrote a report that said he ain't guilty. They took it to the warden and the warden went, I support his release. The parole people are freaking out. Again, when I write the book, I'll publish the reports. They're going, how can we parole him? He refuses to, to, to admit guilt. He continues to insist he's innocent. We can't parole him. We can't parole him. And the warden went, get him the hell out of my prison. And they did. They paroled me, even though I never pled guilty. Because I, That's awesome. I didn't know that part of the story either. Yeah, I mean, there's just really so much cool. people don't know. But I mean, look, I'm not going to say that the wait for this book. the Latin King gave me a... Um, the, 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 I'm not saying they gave me a free pass. Um, mm -hmm. I had to earn their respect, and you earn their respect by um, either fighting them or uh, playing basketball. And uh, I had to go on the basketball courts with these guys, and it was blood. It was literally, <laughs> I mean, elbows to the face, knees to the groin, push you on the ground, kick you, and then they see how you get up. And if you get up and punch them in the face, push them on the ground, then you're in. And so for three years, I played basketball with these guys, combat basketball, and uh, I won their respect. And I'll show you another part of the respect. Um, the prisoners came to me and they'd say, can you help me? And this is the sad thing about the American justice system. It's literally the prisons are full of, I'm not going to say innocent people, but people who never got justice. People who were brought in, uh, got railroaded by a public defender, that were unaware of their rights and ended up in prison. Um, and so I'd review their case. And I'm not a lawyer, but I will tell you this. I got two and a half years taken off a guy's sentence because he um, because they miscounted his uh, his thing. Uh, they miscounted the, the, the years. So I went in, redid the math, wrote it up. Boom. He got to go home for Christmas. And he was just in tears. I got another guy's case overthrown, new trial. I got another guy's case overthrown, but because he was guilty, instead of a new trial, he pled to a lesser charge, got to go home. Um, I mean... And so in the end, in prison, you're not allowed to share. It's a, it's a crime to share your paperwork because there's a whole predatory um, jailhouse lawyer thing where the, the old heads uh, take the paperwork and they pretend to be lawyers and they take money and, and then they send guys and, and they lose. The warden told the block administrator to tell the guards that prisoners were allowed to come to me for advice. No kidding. And they, I'm not kidding. And they literally wow. had a line. When when it first came out, there was a line <laughs> of people waiting. And the head guard came in and he goes, What the hell is this? And they're like, No, 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 we're allowed to. And so what they did is you they did a sign up. So they had a sign up. The, the prisoners would come in, sign up, and then when it was time, you know, all right, uh, six four eight one, six four eight one, go to Ritter, go to Ritter. And he'd come in and I'd have time and I'd review his paperwork. And then when we're done, he'd go in. And they call the next guy in. That's how well respected I was in prison. So what I'm trying to say is anybody who thinks that labeling me a pedophile was going to cause me problem in prison, you are about as wrong as you can get. Now, let me give you a pro tip, guys. Labeling me a pedophile in public, it ain't going to work because it ain't true. I'm not running from it. I'm not scared of it. There's nothing you can do to intimidate me. But what can do, and this is what I'm afraid of, to be honest, is that I keep telling people unwisely to say it to my face. <laughs> and I, I'm very concerned what will happen if somebody right. actually does that. Because I <laughs> we don't, don't want you go going back, back to prison. I for, don't want to go back to prison for taking somebody's life because yeah. that's pretty much what would happen. So I have to tone it down a little, but it does infuriate me. I'll be the first, I'll be the most honest person It infuriates person in the world. me too. It infuriates me. It's frustrating because they're literally trying to destroy my life. Yes. But again, if you want to destroy me, that's man to man kind of stuff. But you're going after my wife. You're going after my children. Guys on the internet are using my children's names. Oh, God. I mean, um, and they're talking about my wife in the most vile ways. As, as, so people need to forgive me sometimes if I get angry, if I blew my temper, if I use bad language. Um, Honestly, you're you know, remarkably things, calm under the circumstances. Well, because, <laughs> because I've already. I didn't initially I didn't want to talk about it because I felt I that by talking about it, it would only give them ammunition. Right. But uh, since everybody else is talking about it and they're getting it wrong, right. I just felt like, what the hell? <laughs> talk about it. You know, you got a question. Ask me the question. I'm not going to run away from it.
I'll be dead I'm so honest glad that you're opening up about this, Scott, because I know it's got to be hard. And I, I just want to remind people that all throughout history, the intelligence agencies, certainly in the 20th century, and all throughout time in spycraft, have used sexual blackmail or sexual allegations to discredit their critics. And because we live in a puritanical society full of hypocrites. I mean, again, I'm not here to excuse any behavior. It's none of my business. Uh, what you know, what people do. Um, but I'll say this: when I look at Congress, the 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 congressmen who scream the loudest about homosexuality. Um, end up having wide stances in men's rooms. In exactly. The Every time. All right. Every single <laughs> Every time. Every single and time. And the people that scream about, you know, transsexuals, this and that and the other thing, they end up having, you know, a closet full of transsexuals. Mm -hmm. And the people, and I'm just going to be frank with you, all you guys out there that are screaming about pedophilia, God help you if somebody ever goes through your search record. Okay, because <laughs> I can tell you what, my Google search is clean. I mean, you know, especially now it's very right. clean um but you know i can guarantee you anybody who's out there going he's a pedophile freeze your computer let me get into your computer and let's see what we find you hypocrite um yeah and if you, know, you don't think that the fbi <laughs> folks frames people on stuff like this go to your favorite search engine and type in operation zorro this was the operation that the FBI ran against Dr. Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King. Yeah. in the 60s, where they bugged his hotel rooms, tried to catch him with a woman who wasn't his wife, tried to blackmail him, even sent the man a letter. The letter basically encouraged Dr. King to commit suicide. Commit suicide, yeah. Yeah. Look, when I, he was I such think a I horrible you person, person, you know. When, yeah, when I, uh, when I resigned from the special commission, I think I told you this about the uh, meeting with the CIA guy. Um, yeah. And, uh, and and he was my friend. I mean, I'll give it, Larry Sanchez is his name. Um, it's not covert anymore. You can say his name. He's a public official. But Larry Sanchez called me up and he said, um, you can't you can't leave because if you leave, the whole thing is going to come down. It's all about you. You've been the heart of this for many years. And if you go, it's there's it, it, literally it will collapse. So we're going to put you on the phone with a senior official in the National Security Council, and they're going to ask you to stay. And I said, OK, I'll take that call. So I got on the phone, had the conversation. They begged me to stay. But in the end, they weren't willing to change what they were doing to interfere with my inspections. They pretty much wanted me to stay and just play the game. And I said, I'm not going to do that. Uh, so I turned it on. I was leaving with my, to turn in my resignation. And he, and he said, you know, shook my hand. He said, Scott, we've, we've been friends, but I, I'll never be able to talk to you again uh, because of this. And um, what are we allowed to say on your air? Anything. Can I say the F word? Oh, yeah. Of course. I mean, I'm not going to do it gratuitously. Yeah. But what he said is. We're not uh, prudes he, here. <laughs> no, but I'm just, I, I think it's important to understand exactly what he said. He said, the moment you walk out this room, understand this. The FBI is going to fuck you in the ass. And they've told me that. And the FBI had been trying to fuck me in the ass. This was in 1998. Since 1996, the FBI had been trying to fuck me in the ass. They'd been following me, harassing my children, harassing my wife, harassing sure. everybody. From 99, all of 1997, Larry Sanchez told me, Scott, you need to be prepared to be swept off the streets. They have the arrest paperwork. The FBI is going to come in and take you off the streets. And I can't guarantee the outcome. What the CIA, because the FBI was accusing me of spying for That's Israel. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the CIA, what the CIA did do is get their senior legal counsel to write a letter to the FBI saying that everything I did was, you know, legally, uh, not only was legal, but had the permission of the CIA to do it, um, right. that I had cleared everything I was doing with the CIA prior to that. No laws were broken, et cetera. But the FBI was like, nope. We're going to get this guy because they wanted to shut me down. They wanted to shut me up. Yeah. That and you matters. know, the playbook, what they're doing now, where they say you're, a, you know, a, a, an agent of Putin, a Putin puppet, a Putin stooge, yeah. whatever. Isn't that 
basically what they were trying to do with your wife in the 90s, saying that she was a Russian spy? Well, I mean, this is a funnier story. Um, it's funny, but it's not funny. I mean, it's sad. You know, my wife and I, we met in Vodkinsk, uh, which is the missile factory uh, that I worked at as a, as a weapons inspector. And everybody's going, oh, such a love story. No, she was an interpreter. I was doing my job. She actually thought that I was an evil spy. Um, and, um, of course you, know, did. <laughs> you know, so, so that's that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't until after I got out of the Marine Corps and, um, and, and we, our paths crossed again. I mean, to be honest, I, I tracked her down because she's, she's a smart lady, a good looking girl. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you know, my wife left me after, uh, after, uh, that she, she, my wife of five years said, um, you know, she can't be married to me because of the Marine Corps. Um, I've gone all the time. She was right. I was gone about 280 days a year. Yeah, you're married um, to the Marines. When yeah. you're in and the so Marines. she was like, you know, you have to choose between me or the Marine Corps. So I resigned from the Marine Corps uh, to mm -hmm. save a marriage. Lost. And then we went to war. And because I went to war, she said, well, you made your choice and and we got divorced. And I, I don't blame her. I mean, she, she did what she did. Yeah. But when I left the Marine Corps, I was a free man. And uh, it was looking like I was going to be uh, working in the in the Soviet Union for H.J. Hines, the tomato people, uh, building food processing plants. And the food processing plant they wanted me to build was in Piatigorsk in southern Russia. So I thought it would be a good idea to go to Georgia um, and see, get a lay of the land. And uh, who did I know in Georgia? Well, Marina, her family was in Georgia. So I would write them and try and get them to give me a, a visa to bypass the tourist visa to be invited. And it was a struggle. Uh, funny story. They finally, she finally said yes, but then I got, I got ordered to, to Saudi Arabia. Now, before I initiated contact with her, because I was an intelligence officer, even though I was read out of programs, um, I went to the special security officer and I said, I am in contact with the Soviet because I'm getting out. This is what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm planning on going there, et cetera. But I wrote it all up and I, and I put it on yeah. record and he yeah. wrote it and he said, okay, so now I'm going to war. I read back into the programs. I'm down in Tampa Bay, Florida, and I'm getting ready to get on the C-141 to go off to war because I, I'm one of the only people. I had the highest clearances in the land. I mean, I knew everything. Just to be clear, you're talking about the first Gulf War, right? The first Gulf War. This is 1990, uh, 1991 1990. at this point, uh, January. Yeah. And so I become, they designate me a um, classified courier. They hand me a package of classified information. And I have to carry a, a sidearm. So I get a 45 pistol, you know, loaded. Um, because if you try to take it from me, I kill you. Um, and so I'm going on the airplane and on my way to the plane, walking across the tarmac, two cars come screaming up. Wham. You see, while I was waiting to deploy, I was trying to call Marina's family to tell them I couldn't make it. I was supposed to get out of the Marine Corps and go visit them in February. But now I'm going to war. So I'm trying to call them and say, I can't visit. I, I'm not going to be there for dinner. <laughs> right. And so I'm making the call, but I, I can't get through. I get to the to the operators, but, you know, trying to make a call from the United States to the Soviet Union, very difficult and get disconnected. So I never succeeded in getting through. These guys stop and they come out and they take my gun away. They take the classified information away and they read me my rights. And I'm like, hmm, what the hell's going on here? They pull me into a room and the guy goes, this is going to be very short. Um, why were you trying to call Moscow? I said, I wasn't trying to call Moscow. And they start going for the cuffs because they got me. I said, I said, I was calling Tbilisi trying to get a connection to Sukumi. They're like, they look at the record and they're like, yeah, he was calling Tbilisi. Why were you calling Tbilisi? Well, I was trying to get in touch with this girl whose family I was going to visit. And they're like, what? And I said, here's the deal. Reached to my wallet, pulled out. The, I said, that's my special security officer. Smart guy. I said, call him right now. There's a report on file that I wrote. It'll have her name and talk that my effort to call them and all that. And he'll confirm everything. They called him up and they came back and they went, this is the craziest story we ever heard. They said, here's the deal. Here's your gun. Here's the classified information. Get on that airplane and have a good war. Just don't try and call Russia from Saudi Arabia because nobody's going to understand. <laughs> and so I had, I had to go to war on that. So right off the right. bat, you have this issue. Um, but we got married when I got out of the Marine Corps. And um, in 1994, um, while I was in the Marines, you know, we, we have kids, her family, her father, her, her parents were refugees. They got, they were part of uh, the civil war in Georgia. So they were ethnically cleansed. So we had them. 
So you have twins, you have the parents, and it's financially, it's, it's difficult um, to make ends meet. So while I was deployed into Iraq doing God's work, um, Marina calls up my father and says, um, I want to help Scott out. Here's a lot of stress on him about, you know, you know, earning enough money for the family. I want to get a, I want to get a job. And he doesn't, he didn't want me to get a job because he felt that, you know, he didn't want to put pressure, but I wanted my dad. That's how the trouble started. She wanted my to dad get a said, job. Yep. Why don't you call the FBI and see if they'll hire you as a linguist? And she said, will they do that? And he said, try. So she did. And she took the test and she passed the language test. But then what happened is because I was who I was and the CIA wasn't happy about what I was doing in Iraq, the CIA said, oh, no, 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 no. Scott's using her to get into the FBI to get secrets about the investigations that she can then give to Scott and then he can give them to who? The Russians? Mm -hmm. I don't know what they thought. Hmm. But she became a, a target of investigation. And so they, you know, they, they basically didn't hire her and they put her on what they call this congressional watch list of known foreign intelligence attempts to penetrate the U.S. intelligence community. So my wife suddenly became this With known zero guy. evidence of that. None Just whatsoever. put her on a watch list. She's the mother of twins. I mean, great cover story. So, um, wow. so anyways, long story short. Uh, 2001, and the FBI wants me to uh, help them out uh, going after um, uh, Naji Sabri, who's the Ira Iraqi foreign minister. There was rumors that he wanted to defect and that he had information about weapons of mass destruction. And I was meeting with Naji Sabri in the Iraqi mission trying to organize a, um, you know, a, a movie to make a movie. And um, so the FBI came to me and they said, um, hey, would you be willing to uh, just go in and, and and just tell us what his mental, what, what he's thinking, you know, all that stuff. I said, sure, I'll do that. I mean, I'm an American. I don't want a war. I'd like to find out what the Iraqis are thinking. So I did that. And uh, they came back and, and they're like, well, that was good. We, we, you know, how'd you like to come on and get on our Iraq team and, and help us, you know, figure out what's going on with weapons of mass destruction? I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And they said, well, first thing, <laughs> first thing though, we have to solve the problem with your wife. I said, there's no problem with my wife. No, no, she's on the congressional watch list. Is that went, the first really? time you found out? First time I heard about that. Wow. And they said, well, she needs to take a polygraph. And I'm like, hmm, this sounds very strange. You guys want me to do something, but you have to polygraph my wife. And I and, and then they brought in other agents. And, oh, no, this is not normal, standard, routine, da-da-da. And I'm like, I did a polygraph. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I've... I, I ran a polygraph program. It's not routine. I'm not, but they convinced me. So I went to Marina and I said, look, they'd like to polygraph you. Just, they say it's no big deal. Get it over. And she's like, well, it's strange, but I've got nothing to hide. I'll, I'll, I'll do the polygraph. So she went in and she did the pre polygraph interview with two very good looking FBI girls who were just her friends, the best friends in the world. Don't worry. Marina will be there every step of the way. This is not a big deal. Da 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 da. And then the day of the polygraph, Marina shows up. The girls aren't there. Instead, they have this asshole who um, brings her in, and he does. He conducts what's called a hostile polygraph, which means it's not about the polygraph. It's designed to intimidate you to confess. And he immediately throws a document down and starts screaming at her. You falsified government documents. You're a liar. I could arrest you right now. I could put you in jail. I could throw away the key. You're never going to walk away. And she's like, what lie? You said you didn't have any contact with foreign intelligence, but this person is a, you know, in the embassy, that's a KGB guy. Da, da, da. And she's like, I don't know that. You have to know that. I don't know. You said you're friends with his wife. I am. Then you know he's a spy. I don't know he's a spy. I mean, he, he might be a wow. spy, but I don't know that. And they're going on and on. And then they say that, I mean, and then it gets crude. It, it's basically, we're going to fuck your family. Her parents live with us. We have green cards. We're gonna fuck your family. We're gonna send them home. You're gonna. We're gonna fuck your brother. We're gonna fuck your husband. We're gonna fuck everybody unless you confess to your crime right now. That's and what they to do. To her credit, she stood up. She put her hands out and she said, "Cuff me. Cuff me right now." And when they didn't, she said, "That's because you got nothing, and I'm done." And she left, and they're screaming at her. I mean, this would make a great movie scene. They're Your wife is a hell of a courageous perfect, lady. Perfect face. 
we're going to fuck you. You're going to get a, you'll never get off the list. You'll never get off the list. And she leaves the FBI headquarters and they've been going after us ever since. I mean, yep. I, I mean, I could just bend your ear all night about the things they've done. To the present that's what the day, FBI does right? Yeah. To, and here we are. Very again. And you know, most of the slanders online against you, certainly on Twitter, come from <laughs> NAFO fellas. Oh yeah. You need to explain to our listeners who and what NAFO is, who created NAFO and what NAFO does. Well, NAFO stands for North Atlantic Fellas Organization. It's not a serious organization. Um, they basically are trolls. They, they admit that their number one tactic is shit posting. Mm -hmm. Their job isn't to be factual or anything. What they, You've probably what seen them. You know, when you're on Twitter, they're always the ones who have the avatar image the of Shibu the Inus. Yeah, Shiba yeah. Inu or whatever. The dog. Yeah, the little doggy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and there's a, a former Marine who came out and he saw, uh, the, long story short, is they, they create this organization. And if you register with them, then they, they issue you a Shibu Ina, Inu meme. And then you can put that on your thing. You're now a fella. But the whole thing about them is if they see something that they deem to be pro-Russian, then they basically it. put out the call and they swarm it. And the idea is to just basically swarm you shit post you and get you to back down, get you to quit, get you to do whatever. Oh, and then the other thing they do is they, several times. they mastered they the, uh, the, the Twitter algorithm. So yeah. by filing complaints against you, they can trigger the algorithm to get you kicked off of Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, so and they very use that draconian German law to do it. They file the yep. complaints with Twitter saying you're violating German law. German laws. Yep. <laughs> I mean, right. I, so I, been I get, that road. I know you have. I get five or six uh, uh, notifications from a Twitter day. a day yep. that I'm, uh, that I'm in violation of German law. <laughs> Me um, too. Fortunately, but, you know, Twitter that, ignores that's what the, that, that's what the you've fellas been banned do. off Twitter more times than I can count, Scott. Yeah. The, 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 the thing about NAFO is they, um, they pick a theme. So their theme right now is to take, um, my uh, sex offender registration page, mm -hmm. um, which again, I just want to tell people, Pennsylvania made me a level three, a uh, sexually violent cr uh, predator, the highest level possible. Uh, they just, again, manufactured a case. So when I was paroled, I came to New York. And um, the thing about it is every state is responsible for assigning their own um, level. And generally speaking, it's automatic. And so whatever Pennsylvania said came over in New York, but there was a hearing. And at first I was just like, I, I just, I don't want to do this hearing. I'm just, but then I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm going to fight this thing. So I went to the hearing. I represented myself. I wrote a, um, what they call a motion in limine uh, to, to, because I said, the only way they can make me a sexually violent predator is if they allow the unsealed files to become in and interpret it in an incorrect fashion. Um, and I had a New York Supreme Court case unanimous that said that that was illegal. So I fought it. I went, represented myself, and wow. um, I beat them. The prosecutor here, um, uh, uh, she knows who she is. <laughs> uh, she she was pulling out all the stops to get me a level three assignment. Um, at the end of the day, the judge cited on my, and what the judge basically said is the entire case is, is flawed. Um, it, it was. There's no case here, but because New York can't overturn a Pennsylvania conviction, the right. conviction stands, but it's going to be a level one, the lowest level, low level offender, you know, no risk to society. And she so for me coming. to understand what you say all these years later, you're still appealing, but you're appealing in the state of Pennsylvania, correct? I still in the state of, yeah, in Pennsylvania. Yep. No, I just got my, um, Oh, looky this there. Is my, this, is, this is my initial response from the, uh, the superior court and they have remanded because I challenged the lower court's decision. They've remanded it back to lower court saying that I have a case. So all you haters out there, I'm not going to wait. Say, but you know what I want to say. <laughs> wait. wait, watch this space. Uh -huh. but the, you know, Scott's going to get the last point. laugh. Be careful folks. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, look, don't count your chickens before you have. That's true. Um, That's true. Pennsylvania is the justice system will do. And it's, there's, there's no guaranteed outcome except this. I will never stop fighting. Right. I will never accept the conviction. I will always fight the conviction because that's what innocent people do. Exactly.
I think have we've you, spent have you time told on this it. story before? You got a lot of first time information. I tonight, think we guys. got ourselves a scoop. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but there's trust Thanks. me, I'm sitting, I'm sitting on a couple of boxes worth of stuff that if uh, at some point in time when the appeal's over, if I want to, I, I mean, I have a lot of people saying you have to write this story because it is such a gross misrepresentation of justice. I mean, what what happened to me? But it's not it's not what unique. a painful taken... book to have to write. And well, I, it I, is. I know yeah. if you have the support of your wife and your family to tell this story, I hope to God you do. Well, she wants me to tell it. Yeah, she wants me to tell it more than I want to tell it. I would think um, so. But, you know, she um, she's very supportive. Um, look, I, I, let's put it this way. Uh, when 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 this first came down. She was very, very angry at me, getting ready to tell me to pack my bags and leave the house. Who could but, blame her? Uh, when, they, when they published the transcript of the interaction, she took it, she went upstairs, and she locked herself in the room. And um, I can guarantee you that if anything on that transcript had implied um, that I was going after underage girls, she would have come out. She would have left said, your ass. Kick, well, she would have kicked me out. <laughs> That's left right. Kick me out of the house. <laughs> And she came out, and to her credit, she said, um, I'm not happy. I'm not happy about any of this. I want you to know that. I am not happy. But she said, there's no crime here, and we're going to fight this thing. And um, and she stood by me the whole time. You know. Now, that's and a Valentine's was, Day love story, folks. Well, she, she, she's the best wife in the world. She stood by me uh, through, through the hardest times, um, and she never lost faith. Um, you know, and they tried their best to destroy her. I, and people have to understand this. When you send the breadwinner to prison, right. you destroy the family. And that's their whole tactic because they want to break you. And one of the best ways to break a prisoner is to have the wife break leave the them, to deny them access to their children. To And then they break in prison. Prison's yes. not about rehabilitation. It's about destroying human life, plain and simple. And while I wouldn't plead... I wouldn't plead uh, guilty to something I didn't do. She wouldn't let them beat. And I don't need to go into what she did, but she she ended up working to save our family. She worked four jobs. Because um, they're trying I, to break you financially too. Well, they almost did. Oh, <laughs> I know. Did. I mean, we're, I we are just now. I mean, it's been, I don't know how long since I got released. We are just that. We still haven't turned the debt corner, but we're just now getting to the point where we're like, we might be able to turn that debt corner and get out of the, because we had to go bankrupt. And anybody who hasn't gone through bankruptcy doesn't understand what that does to you. You can't get credit cards. You can't, uh, you can't do anything. And when you're denied employment opportunities, uh, because who's going to hire a twice convicted pedophile? Uh, you know I mean? So you're denied. They won't even let you speak at an anti-war rally. They won't even let me speak at an anti-war rally, but yeah. you know, I'm not getting paid to do that. But um, no, yeah, but I mean, that's that's a long story short. So anybody who wants to know why I'm not speaking at the, it's because of that story. That's the back story. 